<laughs> um, right, so um, obviously there's a kind of set of things that I wanted to talk about today, but it would be useful to know if you've got any particular questions or anything that you particularly want to try and cover um, in the session, um, maybe so I can try and tie it in or perhaps it's in there already anyway. Um, I've heard all sorts of mixed things about when you would need to do M NHS ethics. Okay. Mixed advice right. from colleagues, <coughs> mixed advice from the office, depending on which approach I would take, yes. and it would just yeah, it'd be yeah, quite yeah. useful to get a sense of right. when what that entails and when it's necessary. Okay. So that's in there a bit later anyway, so we'll talk about it, but, but yes, you've got questions we can follow up. Um, it would be great to hear more about um, your thoughts on engaged research and okay. specifically some of the ethical dimensions of um, different kinds of stakeholders and participate, participants and participating in different ways and at different times and when that kind of begins and um, yeah, some of the kind of ethical ways of talking about different types of participation in research. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll try, yeah, I'll see if we can get that some things, but if there's, yeah, we'll just chuck stuff in or we can cool. go back and look at particular That's things. Good. I don't think we've covered that Thank fully. You. Um, just while it's in my head, actually, I know Involve issued some new guidelines um, last month about members of the public as co applicants on mm. research. Um, so we are looking at that. I've got a meeting tomorrow with our with HR colleagues and people from the insurance office just to try and understand any issues around our relationships with members of the public as co-applicants and responsibilities and all sorts of areas. So that's probably one area that I, I'm still really unclear on yeah. until we've had that discussion, but I can always follow up that's fine. Thank with you. you later on if that's something that's of particular interest. I know it is for Katrina. It's, and, it is, um, and it is for everybody. For everybody. Actually, I mean, that's yeah. what a lot of so, our research is, the, the method yeah. we're using and the yeah. approach we're taking. So I think everybody would be nodding at this okay. point. <laughs> yeah, right. so, so that is definitely one of my good to follow up on. That definitely. And, and it in, you know, in reverse, if there's anything confused. we can do to, yeah. you know, offer you anything, then I'm sure we're all very willing to do that. Yeah, no, that's really useful, actually. I know there's a few other researchers around that are interested in that, too. So. Okay, so... Um, so the idea of this session is uh, it's good practice in research, but it is absolutely not about me telling you how to do your research or what to do, or because there's no way I could do that. You, you know that far, far better than I ever could. So it's not about that. It's just about highlighting some things that perhaps I want you to be aware of or to just have in the back of your mind or to think about when it's, when it's relevant or just to remember where there are where there's some help and guidance available if, if you should need it at a later date. So, so if you sort of think about it as a kind of overview of a lot of things, just to have somewhere in the back of your mind, just in case you need it later, rather than me telling you that you have to do particular things, other than where we talk about regulation and there may be some stuff that you have to do, but that's, well, we can come on to that. Um, so the idea is that we are going to have a quick look at research integrity and then research ethics principles, um, very quickly have a look at research misconduct and some of the more questionable practices around research, um, common dilemmas, um, very quick look at data management, um, that's a whole big topic in itself, so it's really just signposting to some other information, things to think about, a um, little bit on data protection, a little bit on authorship publication, um, we'll look at ethical approval, so the different routes, um, including NHS and some of the external ones, and then really briefly, but again, signposting just on some of the researcher safety issues and some of the bits of legislation and guidance that you might need to be aware of, depending on the kinds of research that you're doing. Um, hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end, but and I'm always happy to follow up after the session, but if there's anything during the session that you want to stop and talk about or ask a question, then feel free. Um, and we'll try and get through it. <laughs> it's quite a lot to cover, but we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, and we can always follow up later on. Um, so, forget that. Okay. So, just briefly, um, 
you may have heard the terms research integrity, possibly the term responsible conduct in research um, or responsible research and innovation. There are a whole sort of set of terms that might be used, but essentially it is about good practice in research. So some common core principles that we want every researcher to kind of be aware of and to think about while they're carrying out their research. So from our point of view, we want researchers to be reliable. So it's about reliability of the research that you're carrying out and the data and the information that you're processing um, and around the analysis and methods that you're using. So, for example, that might bring in issues like um, replicability and reproducibility of results. And when you publish your, your work, you know, explaining exactly how you've done it and using clear methodology that could potentially be reproduced by others. Um, it's about honesty, so developing and undertaking research that you of your own research, but also in the way that you work with other people and the way that you potentially will review other people's work as well. Um, and obviously around reporting is also well, honest and transparent reporting. Um, respect for colleagues and um, research participants particularly, so ensuring their safety and dignity and well-being. Um, also more broadly, perhaps less relevant for you, but also respect for things like the, the environment or, or cultural artefacts, if that's what you're working with. Um, being accountable for the research, so you are accountable for everything that you do as a researcher um, in the way that you design, carry out and conduct your research, but also again in the way that you report it and disseminate it to other people, in the way that you collaborate with others. Um, I guess that's about the wider impact that your research might have on, either on other people, other researchers, the research community, but also on the wider public, um, which is going to be more of a consideration for you and also about good stewardship so it's about um, all, all of those standards they, they kind of come together to mean that, that the research record is, is useful and comprehensive and can be built on by other researchers because there is a good solid foundation for them to use and to, to reproduce and to build on um, but also about making sure that you're not wasting resources so it can be funding um, kit whatever, but also, crucially, you're not wasting people's time, um, particularly where you're working with research participants and you're asking for contributions and, and effort from them and, and you, know, you need to make sure it's well-designed, well-conducted research so that you have some useful information that comes out of it. Um, you can see uh, I've given you the link to our web pages on there, so this has links to all the, quite most of the things that I'll be talking about today so that you can access them through the web page, but also from the slides. Um, I won't go into this a huge amount of detail, but um, the ideas, all of the, those principles and the ideas around research integrity and ethics have quite a long history now. So originally, they, um, the first code that sort of set out how research should be conducted was the Nuremberg Code, so that was published in 1947. Um, that was published after the Nuremberg doctors' trials that were held at the end of the Second World War. So that, that was a US-led panel of judges that, that tried um, the doctors that had been working in the Nazi concentration camps. And during that time, those doctors had been carrying out experimental work, um, some really quite horrific and harmful work, um, clearly without the, the consent of the prisoners that were taking part in, in that research, you know, causing them a great deal of harm and suffering, um, but arguably very little benefit. Indeed. So the Nuremberg Code was the first place where the ideas of sort of autonomy, so participants, for example, being able to choose whether to take part in research and being able to stop and taking part and to withdraw from the research when they chose to do so, and also the idea that researchers should, should not cause harm which seems really fundamental to us, but, but, but actually you would be surprised, I think, you know, to, sometimes to the, the level of harm that, that some researchers have caused in the past and potentially will still cause today. Um, that was followed by a whole range of codes. Um, one that you might be aware of was the Declaration of Helsinki, which was first published in 1963, now on its 13th version, I think, most recently, 2013. Um, so that also sets out or re-emphasises those ideas around um, the researcher not causing harm to participants, making sure that there are protections in place for the participants. 
Um, those two are obviously quite focused on medical or clinical research, um, but, but since then there have been a number of sort of broader international standards. So um, one that, that we look at um, particularly, and it's especially important if you are in receipt of European funding particularly, um, is the European Code of Conduct. Um, there's also the, the Singapore Statement, which was published in 2010, um, and the, there's a, a Montreal Statement as well. There are links to all of these from our website, but they, they essentially set out very, very broad principles of good practice, rather like the ones we looked at on the first slide, that all researchers, regardless of discipline and background and what type of research they're doing, can sort of work within and can understand and comply with. Um, in the UK, we have the Concordat to support research integrity. So that was published by um, various funders in 2012. Um, that sets out five commitments that researchers need to follow, but also importantly, commitments on research integrity for funders and employers of researchers. So that sets obligations on us to make sure that we are supporting researchers to work within those standards and, and to work to, to high ethical standards in the research that they carry out. <coughs> um, and then finally, we have our University of Exeter Code of Good Practice in the Conduct of Research. Um, it's really quite short. If you haven't read it, I'd really love it if you could. <laughs> um, the, it's linked from our webpage. It's really easy to find. It just sets out our expectations for researchers, really along the, the lines of those principles I mentioned just now. So the idea of reliability, honesty, accountability, um, and the way you know collaboration with, with other people. So that's really important to be aware of. Um, Don't we have to say we've read that when we do an ethics application? You do. Yes. I yes. have actually read it, but yeah. it, it, it is important. I mean, it does, you have. If you're going to be honest, you know, you do actually have to go and read it. Yes, you do. Like the terms and condition boxes you tick at the end of a website when you buy something. But, um, but yes, if you if you do. Um, if you haven't read it, I'd be very pleased if you if you could. It really is quite short, um, and just sets out the expectation. So, so why is it relevant? Given that the codes first came from clinical research, and a lot of the principles and the um, guidance that's still available to researchers is is quite heavily focused on clinical research. Um, it may start to feel that it's not relevant to all disciplines, but I really think it is um, because it's about high quality research, essentially. So it's about well thought through, well designed, well conducted, good data management, all of those things that are fundamental to just producing good research that is of high quality and that can be published and can be built on by other people. And I think that's relevant regardless of which discipline, whatever you back. It's about maintaining public trust in research. Um, we'll look at some examples of where that, that has been damaged and, and how significant that is. Um, but members of the public fund most of the research we do, either through um, taxes, government funding, or through charitable donations. And it's absolutely critical that we maintain that trust you know, in, in research as, a, as an endeavour and in the institutions that carry it out. And particularly for individuals, if, you need to be able to um, potentially recruit participants in your research. Um, people that come after you will want to recruit participants as well, will want to ask for time and contributions. And if the trust has been damaged, then that becomes progressively harder for other researchers and for you too. Um, obviously, participant safety, dignity and well-being is critical. We'll talk a bit more about that when we look at the ethics principles later. Um, and just essentially, it's about, you said, about being honest, isn't it, really? It's about just our core values and, and the way that, that we choose to work. Um, the university has its core values. One of those is, is rigour. So that's all around that sort of accountability and, and reliability of the work that you carry out. So that's, that's really important to us as an institution, but also to all of us as individuals, I guess. Um, there are some sticks as well. So um, UKRI have various funding conditions, for example, that mean that researchers that commit research misconduct may have funding removed, withdrawn. Um, if the institution doesn't comply with that, 
Concord Act to support research integrity, there are financial pe penalties and potentially other um, sanctions. So it's, it's, there are some sticks, some, you know, some penalties in place potentially if, if we don't follow the, the rules. Um, and also it's about all stages of a research project. So it's, I'm not just talking about writing your ethics application and submitting it to the committee. I'm talking about everything that you do um, from your current research projects right through to you know, future research, the way that you collaborate with other people, potentially the way that you go on to supervise your own students or to, to lead research teams in future. So I would argue it's kind of critical for all of those things. So, very briefly, I won't labour the point. Um, what do you think research misconduct is? Could you give me a definition? It's failing to adhere to the principles, values, and guidelines that you've previously laid out. It's about you know not doing what you said you'll do. You see what I mean? If you've said yeah. you'll do X and you don't do X in a yeah. way, that's mis you know, I will I will contact you afterwards and let you know what's happened. Even it feels like a relatively small thing, but if you don't do that, it's mm -hmm. it's misconduct in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um written comments as well, just in case. Yes, I will. Um, <laughs> so Quite often, it's going to split into two categories. So, so might be defined as major forms of research misconduct, which would be things like falsification or fabrication of data, um, plagiarism, so using other people's work without appropriate acknowledgement. Um, it would also be um, a breach of duty of care, essentially. So, so failing to look after your research participants or causing them harm, for example, or causing harm to your fellow researchers, um, and essentially misrepresentation, so misrepresenting your role or other people's <coughs> role or the work that you've done. Um, I mean, our university code has a, has a slightly broader definition. We would, in some codes, you would see that the fabrication, falsification and plagiarism is kind of seen as the major forms of misconduct, but we kind of feel that it's a bit broader and that actually things like duty of care to participants are absolutely critical. Um, then there are a whole series of what are sometimes called questionable or poor, or occasionally I have seen it referred to as sloppy research practices. Um, there's a couple of examples on here. So this is another nice cartoon that I like around um, interpretation of significance, statistical significance. Um, so there's something called harking, so which is which is hypothesizing after the results are known. So effectively you know, potentially reporting on different outcomes or, or reporting on um, potentially a, a significant result that you might have found in a sub-analysis that wasn't what you were looking for in the first place, for example. Um, also, it could be um, also sometimes called p-hacking. So actually, that's the example of the cartoon. So, you know, sort of manipulating the statistical significance, maybe playing up one, finding, downplaying another one, for example. Um, or perhaps doing sub-analyses on very sort of specific areas that weren't what you were looking for in the first place or what you hadn't intended to do initially. Um, that can also sometimes be called torturing the data, which kind of is quite a descriptive word for it, isn't it? Um, also things like, um, there's a little image there, so image manipulation, so, you know, using the same image to represent two different findings, for example, or, or digitally manipulating images, so you're using editing software to tidy, tidy up outliers that don't quite fit the pattern that you wanted to see. So those, those kinds of things. Um, also issues around um, authorship, so you know, misrepresenting your role or that of other people, um, authorship disputes, publication issues, that kind of thing. We will have a quick look at that later on. Um, and also potentially covering up somebody else's misconduct, so failing to report any concerns or issues that you have. Um, how often do you think that happens? 
Hopefully not very often. I think it depends on the severity. Mm -hmm. Like you might find that they're very serious, um, or things that we would define as very serious forms of misconduct. Slightly rarer, but like any authorship disputes, I would struggle to find a like a early career researcher whose work hasn't in some way been like taken by a senior colleague. <laughs> like that's a guarantee. Like that's I think that's pretty widespread. I think you could fairly firmly say that that's pretty likely. Um, I think there's a real variety between different things and how common they are, and in different spaces. And different things will be more common in different disciplines. Like the English lot aren't going to be manipulating p data or p values, something, but they'll do other things. <laughs> if you were trying to hold English lit people to the standard of not cherry picking their examples, you would never get you would not get anywhere. <laughs> And whether or not it's recognised externally as misconduct mm -hmm. or, and by yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Things that just just kind of go under the radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. an interesting point, particularly the, those two that you've just made in the context of this centre. Because, of course, being transdisciplinary and having people from lots of different disciplines, you know, as Veronica kind of alluded to, you know, something that might be seen as questionable in one discipline. I'm not saying it wouldn't be questionable in another, but it would be a case of, oh my goodness, I hadn't thought yeah. about that. Yeah, no, and local practice and local expectations yeah. vary hugely. It really can be. Yeah. Um, and also, not to, it, it can just be mistakes. You know, people make mistakes or they don't quite know how to do something and don't feel able to ask for help or don't quite understand or don't know how to use a particular bit of software. So it can be all sorts of things. It doesn't have to be necessarily a sort of deliberate sitting out to do um, no so obviously prevalence is really quite hard to judge because it's not something that people are going to be volunteering lots of information about um, there have been some studies into it so there was a systematic <coughs> review in 2014 it would have been now um, that suggested that um, this was on, on sort of the review of self-report measures so um, up to about 2% of researchers sort of admitted to one of those major forms of misconduct, although in this case it was defined as fabrication, falsification, and um, plagiarism. So that's not insignificant. Um, and then it's about 30, 30%, just under 33%, actually, of researchers admitted to one of those sort of questionable or poor practices, so perhaps not quite doing things as they should have done. Um, but really interestingly, when, when they were looking at measures where researchers were asked about the behaviour of others, so do you know of a researcher who has? Um, it then went up to about 70%. It was about 70% of researchers said, yes, they knew of another researcher who had done one of these things. So potentially it is a bit more <laughs> prevalent than we might like to think. Um, as a university, we do have cases of misconduct. We do carry out investigations. It's not lots every year, but we do. Um, do publish an annual statement on it actually which is on our website but I think in the, in the last academic year we had four sort of full investigations um, and we do have others ongoing at the moment so it's not it does happen not very often but it does so it's important to be aware of um so I'm not going to labour this because there's something perhaps you might want to go away and have a look at later um I've given you um, a link to a documentary that you can have a look at if you want to. So the fatal experiment. So that was the documentary um, about a researcher. This this article on the bottom left corner, um, Paolo Macarini, who worked at Karolinska Institute in Sweden, um, and he, who carried out a series of um, surgeries on participants um, based on flawed data, essentially, and, and was found to have research misconduct but it, it caused a whole series of issues and he was allowed to carry on practicing after he'd after the initial allegations had been raised and he was cleared once and then it sort of came around again and, and lots of very high profile people resigned and it was all you know just an enormous mess for the academic community but specifically for those participants um, who um, died as a result of the surgery um, so that might be one that you want to have a look at at some point um, I suppose the one the couple I'd pick up on, particularly in, in your context, which might be interesting and have had quite a big impact. Um, the, the top one, this guy right at the top, 
um, Deirdre Starpel, who's a social psychologist in the Netherlands, um, he was found to have, there was an investigation in 2013, um, he was found to have committed research misconduct, so essentially fabrication of his data. Um, during the investigation, they found that essentially he fabricated the data throughout his whole career. Everything he had done was based on fabricated data. Um, so clearly he lost his job. The more significant area, um, and I suppose it's to demonstrate the, the, the ripple effect, if you like, the impact on other people. He had provided all of his PhD students with fabricated data. So at that point, all of his PhD students were also implicated. Fortunately, the institutions in the Netherlands really did a lot of work to try and support those students as much as possible, but it had a huge impact on, on them and their, their careers. And on the whole field of social psychology, actually, that then sort of started a, a big debate around replicability and reproducibility of results. Yeah. So, yeah, if you'd cited him, you'd be worried, wouldn't you? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I suppose the other one that is old now, but it still has such a huge impact on public trust, is this bottom right-hand one. So this is the Lancet article that was published um, in by Andrew Wakefield, um, who claimed that there was a link between the onset of autism and the MMR vaccine. Um, you don't have to look very far for examples of where that's still very much having an impact today. Um, the anti-vaccine campaigns, I'm sure you will, have, you will be aware of, um, and some high-profile news stories about that. Um, what a lot of people don't know that Andrew Wakefield was shortly discredited, was, was discredited, the research he'd done was discredited shortly after it was published and he was struck off the, the medical register by the GMC, no longer able to practice. But by that point, uh, there had been so much attention on the initial story, um, lots of parents had to make a decision about whether to vaccinate their children or not, that decision is still going. Um, 2013, the World Health Organization directly attributed this piece of work um, to the, the low vaccination rates, they're still below what the WHO would consider to be safe levels. <coughs> so, and, and quite a few young people died during that time of measles. And it was still in Wales, didn't it? Mm -hmm. it was Wales. Yeah, yeah, no, they had deaths. As well. So, yes, that's, I mean, that, that might be, you know, extreme high profile case, but it, it does absolutely demonstrate that point about public trust as well and about how how much long-term damage can be done. I'm, I'm not sure that's even in the top ten of worst things that I've ever published. <laughs> <laughs> no, true. Um, so there are plenty of other examples. <laughs> I'm going back a few hundred years or so. Fred's an historian. Yeah. I'm sure there are. Mm. I might have to get you to give me some more examples. Reputation for courting controversy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I suspect they're a bit more careful these days. Um, okay. So I don't want to labour the point on the, the big issues because I sort of sometimes think it almost takes away because you know, people think, well, of course I'd never do that or that would never happen. But actually, it might be the, the low level recurring, you know, just poor practice that potentially adds up to have quite a big impact as well. Um, so, very briefly, um, at Exeter, we have various processes for investigating misconduct. So we have the university guidance. Um, that applies to research staff and academic staff um, and is the sort of process that I guess I'm sort of responsible for, um, along with colleagues in HR who are involved in the investigation processes when, when we need them. Um, there is also a, a similar procedure for postgraduate research students linked in with the postgraduate regulations. Um, there is, for postgraduate research students, there is a sort of short online course that you do need to do before you are able to upgrade from home field to PhD. Um, that also incorporates some other information on academic practice. Um, so, yes. Good Supervisors will be telling you all about that. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry, actually, because I wrote a little bit of that, so some of what I'm saying today, will you'll, you'll have to sit through again, but you'll know it well <laughs> by then. Um, so 
Um, we also have a public interest disclosure policy, so a whistleblowing policy um, in the university that says essentially if people raise concerns in good faith, there will be no negative consequences for doing so. And actually more recently, although I haven't put it on the slide, but you may have seen um, some information on the Exeter Speak Out campaign. So the, the, there's, there's a website that explains the various different routes that you have for raising concerns. Um, that can be done through particular individuals. There, there is also an anonymised reporting route now, actually. Um, but I think um, for, for research misconduct or concerns around research practice, anything like that, obviously there's, there's me and my team. I'm named as the external point of contact on the website, so sometimes members of the public might get in touch with me if they've got particular concerns. Um, so that's also open to staff and students. Um, but also, actually, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research is obviously very much involved in this as well and is contactable if you have concerns, um, as are you know, Directors of Research, Associate Directors for Research and, and Pro Vice-Chancellors for Colleges. Um, they can also all be contacted. Um, in addition to that, there, there is also the UK Research Integrity Office website, and that's got some really useful resources on it. So it's got some nice checklists for researchers um, and some other guidance notes that are handy to look at. But they do also offer an anonymous advice service. So that's completely separate from the university. You can log on to their website and lodge a query um, or contact them by phone um, to raise a query. And that's completely separate from the university. So totally external. So I'm going to get you to do, if I can find that thing. I'll do it, shall I? Is it that one? Yeah. OK. So I'm just going to get you to have a quick look at this and then have a little chat about it. Actually, we need to do it slightly differently oh. because um, we, um, sorry, we need to. ...sessions on our research development programme, so we might usually sort of cover. This point. Sorry. It's going to so I'd normally, um, cover more of them. So if you wanted to go back and have a look, there's there's a few of them that have been turned into cartoons, um, like the one I showed you, and then there's a whole series of other ones that might, some of which will be more relevant, some less so. Um, if you wanted to have a look, or if you wanted to bring a few into coffee and have a <laughs> chat about them over coffee one day or something, that would be great. Um, they were all, they were developed by the Erasmus University, so they are available for us to use. Um, the cartoons were added um, by the Printager Project, which was an EU-funded project on, on research integrity um, and ethics. So they, they've just published, they've just reported and done lots of interesting things, um, including a film, which you might like to see. I know it's specifically around, it's called Being a Scientist, um, but actually it is quite general in terms of some of the ideas around good practice. And they've just done it as a little drama following following a, a particular researcher through through some um, experiences. Um, um, there is also a, a US, the US Office of Research Integrity have also produced one, again, sort of more focused on a lab environment, but picking up on some of those more sort of general points around good practice and, and also more about the sort of consequences for individuals. So that's quite an interesting one because you can you can watch it from different people's perspectives. So from the perspective of a student or the, the PI or the um, administrator, I suppose, that has to deal with, with some of the issues. So that's I quite interesting. You don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's me. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, they're, they're interesting. They're, it's also really interesting how different they are because the, the US or I one is just really loud and bright and mm -hmm. full on loud music and the, the, the Dutch version is all very quiet and mute and very, <laughs> very dark tones. <laughs> it's quite interesting. But they're both good. They're both worth a watch if you've got time. Um, so I just want to move on quickly. Was there anything on that sort of general good, good practice research integrity stuff that you wanted to pick up on before? Um, just quickly, I, I always wonder with some of those kind of dilemma things and with, with that um, thing in general, I mean, is the expectation that we will kind of, uh, I suppose, kind of rely on our own judgment um, and kind of, you know, think these things through on a case-by-case -case basis or whether we'll adhere to like a strict 
kind of list that's been predetermined? I think it's, it's quite often judgment mm -hmm. because it will vary a little bit between disciplines and there is no one sort of core set of things that everybody agrees with. I mean, I guess our university ones are perhaps the first place to go, mm -hmm. but they're never going to be specific enough to address every particular circumstance. And I do spend my entire life answering the question with it always, it depends. Um, so so it, it can be quite case by case. But there, there is lots of advice and there's loads of guidance, um, and particularly where it comes to, and we'll, we'll come back to it, but actually that there's a lot of useful stuff on um, that publishers produce now, lots of good guidelines. Um, some of the professional societies have really, really good stuff available, um, oral history. So yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're, they're the brilliant. Thing. They've got loads of really interesting information, and the UK Data Centre and all sorts of other people will pick up on some of those as we go through. So there is lots <coughs> available. Um, yeah, and probably best to seek advice. If you're not sure, then there are people you can ask and advise you. Yeah, sure. Or we can point you in the direction of things to look at. I'll just point you again. Yes. <laughs> and then um, I bring in other people. I did you a favour the other day, actually, um, because um, I put in an ethics application, yeah. and I think it had your name at the end as a person to contact if things get really bad. Um, and I thought, oh, they won't need that. I'll just leave Jana Funkers on, and it'll be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so make pretty young. Yeah, yeah, so lightning will work for them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Depending on how many ethical queries you think you're going to get on that friend's project. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. They do come from some odd places occasionally. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to scoot through this really fast um, because these topics that could take up whole sessions by themselves, but I just want you to remember a few things. Um, so, as far as good research data management goes, there are other training sessions specifically on this through the Researcher Development Programme, so they would be worth following up if this is something that's particularly critical for your work. Um, really important thing to do as early as you possibly can is to write a data management plan. Um, if you're going to be processing lots of data, and it's absolutely critical if you've got identifiable participant data. But regardless of your research, it's just always a good thing to do. Um, the university policy is that all research projects will have a data management plan, um, and it is absolutely mandatory for some funders, so UKRI, Wellcome Trust, um, European Research Council, for example, it is absolutely mandatory that you have a data management plan. Um, you can see I've given you the link to the library research data pages here. Um, there is, I think it's worth saying that two of the people who are coming to the workshop in May are from one's from the library and one's from the repository data oh, repository. Oh, Chris. So Chris Tibbs yes, from the data repository, brilliant. images yes, from brilliant. the library. So yeah. you've got time between now and May to work up your questions. Yes. Yeah. No. Have a look at these web pages because Chris has rewritten them recently, and yeah. there's, there's and loads Chris of good stuff. Chris is really good. Yeah. yeah brilliant. Very helpful. Brilliant. I, yeah, we do sort of double hand I'm sure quite we do. a lot of yes. stuff, yes. so yeah. that's really good. Um, the, I'm sure he'll mention as well, but we do have um, online data management plan templates, so DMP online that you can access through the library webpage. Um, there are different templates for each type of funder, but also um, a sort of generic non-funded, unfunded research template that you can use. We have adapted them, so they are University of Exeter specific. Um, answer with, with all the questions that the funders require, but we have also added um, some data protection impact assessment questions into them. So if you, if you use those DMP online templates, then you're doing the data management plan and also the data protection impact assessment, which can be really helpful as a sort of guide, things to think about, questions that you might want to follow up on if you do have um, personal data. I'll come back to data protection in a minute. Um, really, obviously, Records have to be complete, organised and secure. Make sure you know what you're collecting, where you're storing it, um, and also what might happen to it long term. So how long you need different bits of data for what you're going to do with it. What happens when you no longer need it? Do you need to keep all of it all of the time? Can you start destroying certain bits? Um, make sure you know with your research team, your supervisors, what happens once you've, if you move on from the university and there's still data around. Um, just think about it in advance. 
Make sure you know who owns your data. So if you've got funding, make sure you've read your funder terms and conditions and you know whether there are any clauses or statements in there about data um, and that you're meeting your requirements. Open research. Again, whole big topic by itself. Chris will talk about that. That's in May. the other person who's coming <laughs> in May is Robert Kiley from the Wellcome Trust. Ah, yes. Open oh. research. Yes. So that's really critical and particularly for particularly the Wellcome Trust. Particularly for Wellcome Trust funded research. Yes. And Plan S, which I'm sure he will talk I'm about. I'm sure he will, yes. And the um, obligation for researchers to publish in open access groups. Um, so again, lots of information available. Think about that in advance if you can, and you start thinking about what you're going to publish. And also, again, think about it in the context of any personal data that you've collected, what you might want to publish, what data <coughs> you want to make available to other researchers in future. Um, obviously, data sharing, so putting, putting data and information on the repository, for example, is good practice and something we absolutely encourage. But you need to make sure that um, it's safe to do so, that you're not violating any contracts, anybody else's intellectual property rights or copyright, um, and also making sure that any participant information is, is safe and, and processed appropriately. Um, so yes, that really is just a, please think about your data well in advance. <laughs> Don't wait till you get to the end and think about it all. Um, and there is lots of people either through the library me and my team can help, particularly around data protection, um, and also there are um, colleagues in Extra IT that can help with sort of physical storage issues and you know, recommending particular services and you know, things that you might want to use. Um, data protection. Um, so again, if, this is usually an area that we kind of have to look at on a bit of a case-by-case -case basis. So if you've got particular questions about your own project and how it will work, it's probably better if we have a sort of follow-up discussion about your particular circumstances or anything that you want to know, rather than me trying to cover all the possible permutations in this. But you just need to know, really, um, hopefully you've all done the online information governance training as a bit of a just general introduction. Um, if you are processing personal data, you're using or collecting storing personal data for your research. Um, there are some specific things that apply. So obviously, critically, you need to make sure that your processing is, is fair, lawful, and transparent. So making sure that the <coughs> participants clearly know what's happening to their data, what you're using it for, how long it's going to be stored for, who, who else it could be shared with. Um, it's important to remember that actually, for, for research purposes, there are quite the, the, um, there aren't that many limits, actually. There are, there are a lot of options for things you can do with personal data for, for research purposes. Um, you have to process personal data for specific purposes, um, not processing more than you absolutely need, for example. But there is this additional, so Article 89, that allows additional processing for research purposes. Um, that means that you can use, you can potentially use data that was collected for other purposes to use in research. Um, there are a whole series of additional safeguards that are needed um, and lots of caveats and it depends on everything else, but it is possible to use personal data for, for research purposes and, and it's not probably not as restrictive as you might think it is. And there are usually ways to do most things, we just need to think about it carefully and think about putting safeguards in place. So those might be technical. So for example, um, storing things on secure servers. So not putting stuff on USB sticks and leaving it on a train <laughs> or um, you know, putting it on your Hotmail account or you know, you, you, there are more secure ways of doing things um, and in, using encrypted servers, encrypted email, for example. Um, specifically so you can share data between researchers without having to email it, um, making sure that access is, is controlled, so making sure that you've got, you know, if it's online or if it's stored on a computer, you've got, you know, passwords on files, you've got passwords on documents, you're restricting access to areas, only certain people can access particular things. Um, and it's also about physical security, so obviously, you know, if it's printed information, bits of paper, consent forms, um, might be audio or video, for example, then you just need to make sure that there are security arrangements around that. Again, there are people that can help with that. And also, if you're using third parties to process data, so if you're asking 
other people to transcribe data for you, for example, um, then we just need to make sure that you've got uh, an appropriate contract in place with that third party. But we can help with that, and, and legal services departments have template data sharing agreements and things that you can use. So there is usually a way to do things, you just need to, to check. Um, and that data management plan and the data protection impact assessment is a really good place to start with that. Again, the earlier you do that in the process, the better. Um, and that can really help you think through all the different implications and what you might need to do and the controls that you can put in place. So that's good to be aware of. Um, one thing that is a bit confusing, I think, is this, the conditions for processing personal data. So I won't go into all of these, um, but essentially there are these six conditions or six bases for, for processing personal data. Um, I suppose the, the point I want to, to get across is that usually for research purposes we are not relying on <coughs> consent and having just talked about consent and people taking part in research this is quite a tricky thing but, but in this context we're talking about consent to process personal data so it's separating that from the consent to participate in the research and the idea that you must be transparent and you must explain what you're doing to your research with your research participants and their data so those two things can sit alongside as a university, we say that we process personal data for research in the public interest. That's our core function as a university, um, particularly where it's you know publicly funded research, for example, that has some public good. Therefore, we process data in the public interest. That means that we potentially have a bit more flexibility. So we're not strictly relying on consent. So that means that potentially you can use data sets for, for research. Um, that you didn't have explicit consent to use. Um, it also means that research that involves an element of potentially um, deceit or maybe not being able to tell the participants in advance exactly what you're doing, um, because if you told them it would sort of maybe change the way they reacted, change the response they, they gave to you, it means that you can still do that type of research but with appropriate safeguards in place. So it does help if we rely, if we use that public interest condition. Um, so there is more information available on the website um, and we can talk about particular projects if you've got concerns. Um, I'm, I'm really scooting through now. Um, so publication and authorship as you said, the whole world of issues in publication and authorship um, and issues around you know, disputes and difficulties for researchers that have concerns about this. Um, obviously, we can't sort of solve all of those things and usually there's not one straightforward answer. But I suppose my message is, as far as possible, think about authorship early in your groups. You know, think about have that discussion early on if you can to try and make sure that there's some sort of mutual understanding amongst your collaborators and people you're working with about sort of what, what publications and what the dissemination plans might be, because that can help to sort of manage expectations and to make sure that you know people don't have unrealistic expectations or aren't you know uh, treated <coughs> inappropriately. Um, always remember to go back to the guidelines, always go back to the journal guidelines or the editorial policies or the um, codes of conduct for the places that you want to publish in. Um, don't just rely on what your friend down the corridor does or, you know, because it, it may not actually be the right thing. And also guidelines can vary quite a lot across different disciplines and across different publishers and across different, um, yeah, across different publishing groups. So, Again, for people that might find themselves publishing in journals that they've never published in before, Absolutely. which, which Absolutely. we are quite likely to do. Yeah, yeah. so always get back to the guidelines. Um, there are some journals that have got guidelines specifically around authorship and what authorship criteria. Um, and lots of different methods of determining authorship. This example, which I'm sorry you won't be able to read, but it just says um, all authors contributed equally to this paper, so the order of authorship was determined by rock, paper, scissors. So, <laughs> That's one way. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I just remember the the point about you know influence on papers. You should be an author, or your contribution should be acknowledged based on the actual role that you played and the contribution that you've made, not by virtue of your position or um, your status in a research field. Um, and remember also, as that example showed, um, the dilemma showed, I mean, obviously you have rewards for being an author, and that's seen as a critical part of an academic um, progression. But there are also responsibilities. So if something goes wrong with that paper, you are, which you are an author on or a co-author on or a role in, then, then you also have a responsibility to deal with any issues that come up. Um, there are a couple of useful resources. So COPE, Committee on Publication Ethics, have got some useful guidelines and, and case studies. Um, that can be a useful first point of contact if you've got concerns or want to start thinking about where you might look for advice. Um, and there is also this really interesting credit scheme, which they, they've sort of started to try and quantify authorship roles and started to come up with a taxonomy, sort of a description of the different roles that, that groups might, or that individuals might have in, in a research group and how that might be recognised in a publication. So that can be quite a useful starting point for discussions. Um, it is quite based on, um, it came from the biomedical background, so it's quite, it does have, you know, descriptions of technical roles and things as well but so it may not always be relevant but it's, it's a good starting point and it's a good neutral starting point for a discussion as well about how those roles and contributions might work. Um, Can I add one to that? There are other yeah. discipline specific associations or organisations that have written, written kind of authorship mm -hmm. guidelines that are really good and I really like um, the BSA, the British Sociological Associations mm -hmm. um, guidelines. Yeah. I'll link to that on our website, but but yes, the, that was a good one. Yeah. yeah, no, I probably should have put some more <laughs> once on the box. No, that's great. Um, um, again, very quickly, another thing to be aware of is, is bias, so unconscious bias in your Probably from your research background, you will know much more about this than I do, so I'm not going to give you a session on it. Um, it's really just remembering that even if you don't intend it to, actually, you know, biases can have quite a big impact on, on the research literature. Um, there's this little quote from Charles Darwin just talking about how he recorded um, observations that were against his um, his existing views, I suppose, to make sure that he made a note of them because he, he found that he was more likely to forget things that didn't go with his worldview, essentially, than, and that's absolutely something that we all recognise. It's so so easy to pick or look for the things that agree with <laughs> what you already feel, isn't it? So it's just to be aware of that. Um, and I suppose in the research world, it has a particular impact. Um, so we have publication bias, so that is the idea that... Um, the fact that um, papers that have um, positive findings, if you like, or, or statistically significant findings are more likely to be published than those that have a negative or a null finding. Um, have outcome reporting bias, so um, that's the, the, the fact that um, in some Papers, you may have researchers that present their research in a certain way, so they may um, report on particular outcomes that had a, had a more significant result or a more positive result or a more headline-grabbing result um, that may not have been what they were looking for in the first place. Um, citation bias, it's also a fact that papers with positive or significant findings are more likely to be cited by other researchers. Um, and then you also have... Um, what's sometimes called spin or selective focus. So um, that's more about the presentation of results in abstracts and discussions. You know, the, the interpretation of the results may be interpreting them to be a little bit more exciting or um, <laughs> significant than they may otherwise have been. Um, and all of that can accumulate and excuse the research literature, excuse the, the um, basis that other researchers have to work on. And in certain areas, that's really, it really can be quite critical. So if you start thinking about clinical trials, for example, where you have negative findings that aren't published, you have um, selective citation 
of positive results. Um, you have people reporting on different outcomes, so not reporting on their primary outcome measure, for example. You can see how all of that adds up and it skews the literature and potentially skews things like um, prescribing decisions and public health recommendations, for example. So it's absolutely critical. Um, again, we won't watch that now because there's a nice little animation that explains all of that. It gives a particular case study around um, antidepressant medication and, and trials on antidepressant medication sort of shows just, just how big that impact can be. Um, also something might be of use, the whole series of reporting guidelines that might be useful. So there's the Equator Network, who have a series of guidelines that might be of use, and that's primarily around biomedical and clinical research, but it may be helpful. Um, some of the ways of reporting sort of um, clinical research may be, may be helpful in a broader context. And there's also fair sharing, um, which has sort of attempted to bring lots of guidelines across a whole range of disciplines together. So that might be one to have a look at as well. Okay, so I'm going to head to the quick. So, um, I'm not going to go into this too much actually because we're quite short of time, but just I think you might be familiar with some of these. So, the different sort of theoretical approaches, so the idea that there may be um, different frameworks for making decisions. Um, so one day on to logical, so the idea that there are rules and obligations to perform the right action. So that might be, for example, a system of religious belief or a set of instructions to follow. Um, I do a virtue ethics, which you sometimes hear the term virtuous researchers. Um, so that's the idea that, that an individual who is a good or virtuous person will make the right decision. Um, and also the idea of utilitarianism, so that's the idea that, that essentially the right action is, is the one that results in the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, you quite often come across that when you hear discussions of sort of risk, risk benefit analysis and balancing the harms and the benefits to participants, which is what some of the research ethics review process is based on and some of the questions that you be asked in that process. Um, so it's not to say that any one of them is, is necessarily the right way, it's just that there are different ways of thinking of these things. Um, research ethics principles, so I mean again these are quite broadly recognised but we have um, these particular ones sort of outlined in our university policy. Um, so we have the idea of autonomy, so that's autonomy of participants that they can choose whether to take part in research, they should be informed about what will happen um, and to be able to give consent to take part and also able to withdraw, stop taking part, choose to not take part in some, some elements for example. Um, there are some circumstances where there may be an element of deception or potentially sort of covert research, some ethnographic studies, for example. Um, they can be quite ethically difficult and challenging. Um, not to say they're not possible, but they do need sort of some fairly strong justification to be able to do them and also some controls and mitigations in place wherever possible. So those are the kinds of things that ethics committees would be looking at. Um, so the idea of beneficence, so the idea that essentially researchers, research should have some good, some benefit, some might be benefit to an individual, so accessing something that they might not be able to access otherwise, um, or it might be public good, so broader good to a community, to a group, to, a, a, and to um, an organisation, or potentially to a public <laughs> at large. Um, also, obviously, the idea that, that research and researchers should not cause harm, um, should avoid risk and harm wherever possible, and if there are any risks associated with the project, that they should be mitigated as far as possible, and also potentially balanced against the benefits. So that's going back to that, idea, that utilitarian idea, so making sure that um, essentially you are, the potential good outweighs the potential risk. Confidentiality, so obviously the default, I suppose, is anonymization of research participants, so then would usually expect it not to be known that they were taking part in research. Not always the case, 
Um, I didn't pull a PhD. No, exactly. Because it, there are, there are it was of, open science, and, yeah. and a lot of my participants said, we're out in the open, we want to be named. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That was um, interesting getting that through, I think. Yeah. I think it would be yeah, I, know, yeah, exactly I don't think it would be a bit more flexible now. Yeah, I think it probably yeah. would. We're talking yeah. you know, uh, uh, 10 years ago, so yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So absolutely. But it will change, especially, you know, I think it will change as we, as we move to more open research model that you know, so people can expect that to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you're right, and there are circumstances where participants want to be known because they think they can, yeah, because it gives them a chance to tell the story or yeah. because it's just not possible to disguise them. It just isn't because it's something focused on a very specific place or a group or... Yeah. Um, where it would just be impossible to disguise who they were. Everybody and looked at it and go, I know who that yeah, is. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, also, the idea of pseudonymization, so, you know, link, linking people, so, you, you know, you might have a, a use pseudonyms or um, changing details to try and hide people's identity. Um, that can be really quite tricky to do, though. Um, also, making sure that it's really transparent so that if there are limits on confidentiality, so, for example, in your case, you know, that it was okay to do that because those participants would have completely understood the fact that it was open yeah. and that they were identifiable. So it's just making sure that it's transparent and people have the option to choose whether to take part or not based on that information. Um, and also being clear about where confidentiality may stop. So, for example, if a participant discloses a risk of harm to themselves or to others, then you may or would usually need to report that onwards. Um, Planning in advance how you would do that, ideally, so that you don't find yourself in a situation where somebody discloses something and you're not sure what to do with it. So I think that's really important for, for researchers and supervisors where it's appropriate to make sure that there's a sort of clear process in advance. Um, and then we come back around to integrity. So let's see integrity as, as an ethical issue. So it's about you know, protecting the participants and, and making sure that their time and efforts are not wasted, um, be they human or animal. Um, So we have our framework that talks about when projects require approval. Um, so essentially that, that says that any project involving human participants, their data or their tissue, and any project involving the use of animals needs to go through our research ethics process. Um, there are some exemptions to that. So, we can, so examples of you know, clinical audit or audit of any kind, really, where you're you know, evaluating how a service is is how something is running and then feeding back to that organisation or to that individual um, and where the information is solely used within that organisation um, to improve a service, for example. So um, student lecture feedback, when they give feedback on a lecture or when people tell me how good or otherwise my training has been, um, that's audit and evaluation. I don't ask for you know, approval to do that. Kind of thing. Um, and also criticism as well, potentially. Um, there are a whole series of quite grey areas around that. We, we have a working group at the moment looking to rewrite this framework. Um, we've spent an awful long time on the definitions of research, when research needs to be reviewed, particularly around the things about um, public engagement, um, impact activities, um, dramatic performances where researchers are involved in production of a work, for example, you know, where does that then cross over into, into um, research and need for review? So we are still working on that, but essentially, I think, and there will still be some, it depends on case by case, but, but essentially it's about sort of creation of, of new and generalizable knowledge that can potentially be transferred to other settings. So if it's something that's very specifically about particular process or location and can only be useful and can only be fed back into that specific um, service location company, whatever, then, then potentially that, that wouldn't need ethical review. If you think that your activities, so public engagement um, impact activities may sort of become research data, may feed into research outputs and you may want to publish them as research outputs, then that potentially is worth going through the ethical review process partly because some publishers will also ask for evidence of ethical review, and if you haven't gone through that process and then want to publish something as research, that can cause issues later on. Um, so I know there are lots of, uh, you know, lots of discussion, lots of debate around this and, and different opinions, but I guess 
while it is still quite grey, I would just suggest erring on the side of caution if you think you may want to use something as part of your research outputs, then I would go through the ethical review process just to make sure. Um, and we can come back and look at that again, and, and it, it is always a bit case by case, but essentially that's what we say. Um, I think that's kind of where you were alluding to it, wasn't it, Charlotte, this idea of when does it become necessary? Mm. Mm. Yeah. My suggestion is always, you know, I've said to a couple of people, go and talk to the ethics team about yeah. it. Yeah, no, we can and even if they say no, it. at this, you know, it's fine, we think it's okay, at least you've got some kind of yeah. sense then. Mm -hmm. But I, I take your point, if, it's, if you think you might even consider using it in a published piece, then get those, get that done yes. early as well. But yeah, I mean, things like where you're, because I think that was our conversation, wasn't it, around, um, you know, if you're consulting members of the public or, or patient groups on, you know, the content of a survey or about, about what an information sheet says or about where, you know, a particular research direction or, um, you know, sharing research ideas, then that potentially doesn't need to be reviewed. It's just where where you then start gathering data or information that you might want to use in publications or that might be generalizable, might be transferable. But we are still working on that definition. We've got another meeting tomorrow to try and... <laughs> I did actually get an X in the end. <laughs> but it's a conversation we have all the time among ourselves yeah. in the centre. Yeah, it's, know, it's really interesting. It. It's really interesting. And again, because people come with different backgrounds and different understandings and, and we're kind of hammering it out between us. Yeah. So it's interesting yeah. that you're doing the same thing. Yeah. There we are. We are, yeah, and trying to write a policy that applies across the whole university and that researchers in drama and physics and, <laughs> you know, the medical school recognises is quite a challenge, but we're yeah. getting there, we are getting there. So our university guidance should be a bit clearer and a bit more detailed, but it's still slightly in the, in the grey at the moment. Um. <coughs> oh, and in fact... Okay. Yeah, and there are some involve uh, wrote some guidelines on that as well. Actually, um, so we have various review processes. So we have the university ethics committees. So that would usually go through. Um, so each college has its has its review process. Again, we are looking at how that's all working. Um, so essentially, you you go through the committee of your your home college, so where you're registered or where you're employed, essentially. Um, There are circumstances where university ethics review isn't required, so the NHS ethics review process, for example. So if you're carrying out a project that involves NHS patients, um, facilities, staff, if you're recruiting patients based on or participants based on a specific health condition, if you're recruiting them through, for example, an NHS service um, or uh, social care setting sometimes as well. You may need to go through the NHS Ethics Committee. So again, if in doubt, just always ask and ask as early as possible as well because it can be a bit of a longer process. There are also some, some circumstances where actually researchers go through a University Ethics Committee but then they also go through the Health Research Authority process in order to access particular facilities. So it can get a bit complicated but we, but we can always find a way to do it. Um, so just come and talk to us early, I suppose, and we'll, we'll help you through that whole thing. Um, would that, would that end the social care setting, you're thinking about Jessie's project, she's going to be working with people in a variety of settings, yeah. largely older people, yeah. some of whom will, might be in an NHS setting, I guess, but some of whom yeah. might just be in a kind of ordinary care home. Like. Yeah, I, uh, the, the sort of um, conflicting advice I've had about is about, you know, say... I approach an age concern or an age UK chapter and they're not necessarily there because they're a service provider yeah. but the but the organization does provide services mm -hmm. would that require ethics because it's not necessarily clear why that person approached the organization mm -hmm. and I'm not necessarily there to talk about health conditions mm -hmm. but there is this theme that does that I'm, I'm not explaining it very well but um, it's kind of a blurred area. Yeah, it? it can be. Again, Old age is the condition, it, really, is right. it? Yeah. 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 And again, it's a little bit, it, it depends, sort of depends mm -hmm. how you're, why you're recruiting them and whether you're targeting a specific 
group because um, they've been referred through a particular route or, mm-hmm. um, or because they are attending, for example, a service that um, age concern or third sector organisation might be offering under contract to the NHS. Yeah. That can have an impact as well. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you know, we have projects with um, Live Well, who are a sort of community health provider or they provide services, but the, but because they provide those services under contract to the NHS, so they provide um, some of the smoking cessation services, for example, or um, some healthy healthy um, eating sessions for diabetic patients but under contract to the NHS. Mm-hmm. So th- so those do then end up going through there. But the say in that example, for example, mm-hmm. um, rather than approaching them in the diabetes group mm-hmm. or in a, yeah, like a, if it was just sort of advertised more generally through the organisation without targeting somebody yeah. with a specific condition, would that require NHS attention? Potentially not. Okay. That was the only okay. recruitment you were doing. Yeah, okay. Um, That's encouraging. Actually, <laughs> we probably have to sit and look at it. Yeah, I suppose yeah. the only, which um, is on the slides towards the end, I'm running out of time to go through it, but um, the only other thing to be really aware of with research with older people well and actually all, all age groups but particularly with that age group is um is um mental capacity act and the yeah. ability to to give consent yeah so you either need really robust procedures to make sure that you're not recruiting participants who may lack capacity or who may lose capacity mm-hmm. during the project or you go through the nhs process um so that you can recruit participants who may lack capacity. Yeah. Because that, that's a that's kind of a mandatory <coughs> thing if, if you think you may recruit participants yeah. who lack I, capacity. It has I'm to not go particularly that really. looking at dementia, yeah. but I I will come and speak with yeah. you separately about yeah. it. Yeah. No, we do have access to and digress. Um we do have access to um training from Devon Partnership Trust mm-hmm. on mental capacity, which might be helpful mm-hmm. in terms of making you feel more confident about ability to judge capacity yeah, and, and to make like decisions. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, that's really worth pursuing. Yes. Um, okay, and uh, aside from the NHS processes, there are also additional external processes for researchers who want to work with serving military personnel and their dependents, so through the Ministry of Defence Research Ethics Committee, um, projects involving um, the court system have an additional Ministry of Justice process, so again, we can help with, um, and anything involving um, offenders, so prisoners, people on probation, anybody sort of involved in that in that justice system. There is um, another external approval process through the um, probation service, although actually it follows the same route as the NHS processes and uses the same online system um, and then no, there are a whole is right. that the same as what you were just saying in that if you recruited them via that method you'd need it but if you happen to recruit someone who was on yeah. probation then that's irrelevant yeah it kind of is and unless you're specifically setting out to yeah. attract that yeah. so if someone or walked or into an event who happened to be on probation yes. yeah. yeah no you have no kind of control over that and, and recruiting them as you would any other member yeah. of the public but but yes, if you're working, yeah, if you're going to work in prison or, yeah. Yeah, or targeting through probation service. Um, and then there are a whole series of additional approval routes. So if you're using ionising radiation and gene therapy and various things which won't really be relevant to you, but um, there's some stuff on our website about that um, and clinical trials as well. Um, so, but, but regardless of which route you're applying for, essentially they will be asking for the same information. So, thinking about what you're going, what's going to happen to the participants, any risks, how those can be mitigated, um, issues around data, particularly personal data, and um, that's becoming increasingly important. Um, so, it's always helpful to think about it as, a, as the sort of participant journey. So, you almost have to be the participant and follow through the process, follow through every single stage. So, how you're going to recruit them who through, how, who's going to make that first approach, how are you going to advertise, if you are going to advertise, how are you going to find people in the first place, um, what information are you going to give them, how long are you going to give them to consider it, um, how the consent process might work, and from then on through all the different procedures or processes or tasks or whatever it is that you're asking them to do. And just thinking it through, it can sort of help to think about it. 
in that way and then just write down in which stage how you're going to manage it. Um, and also you will need supporting documents, so information sheets, consent forms potentially, um, any advertising and recruitment materials would all go to the ethics committees regardless of which committee that is. Um, really critically, whatever information you provide your participants has to be in a format that's easily understandable, that's readable, um, that is clear to them. You may have to do multiple versions, you may need multiple languages, you may need different um, <coughs> different versions for um, if you know for well, children for classically. Work. Well, yes, that, that's the that's the obvious one. Um, your people that may have you know, um, visual impairments or all sorts of things that you might need to think of, and, and particularly, yeah, so for, for children and, and young people, you'd have separate versions. You might need multiple versions for different age groups. So, you know, a five to seven year old age group will need a completely different set of information to a, a 14 to 16 year old age group. So sometimes you can end up with lots and lots of versions um, and also versions for parents and guardians if you're working with children. And also the idea that um, the parent and guardian will be giving consent, but you also need assent from the child or the young person. Um, you can have all the consent in the world from the parent or the guardian, but if the child doesn't want to do it, then you cannot make them do it. And you must have given them the information to help them decide as best they can whether they want to do it. And they need to understand what's happening to their data and the information that they're giving and what's, what's happening. Um, and also, you can be creative. It doesn't always have to be. And we have university templates for information sheets and consent forms. So if you are providing written information, it would be really good to use those templates because we know they're, they're good, they've had good feedback, we, we know they're GDPR compliant, for example. But you can do it in different ways, so you could maybe think about videos or audio or using pictures, photos. Um, for children, it can be particularly important to present it in different ways. Um, and we have researchers that have, have made brilliant videos to explain, so a researcher that's working in the prison population has done her information as a series of videos, like online videos that she plays in the session because that gets around some of the issues around the literacy levels and, and different languages and levels of understanding. Um, so you can be creative, it doesn't just have to be the written information sheet. Um, but there are a couple of websites that might help with that. Um, I won't go into that now, so that's specifically for the NHS process, just to say that, that my office has this role, so until we manage those projects, we provide something that's known as sponsorship, so effectively saying that, that the research is, is managed appropriately and is, is ready to be done, and sort of helping to keep monitoring and, and helping with things like adverse events and, and um, amendments as projects go along. Mental Capacity Act, which I've just spoken about, so I won't go into again, but essentially um, there are a lot of restrictions around research with involving people who may lack capacity to give consent, or adults who may lack capacity to give consent, I should say. Um, the research must be relevant to the condition, so it must be relevant to the reason why they lack capacity, or why they may lack capacity, um, and has to be, can only be done in that way. So if, if you could do the same research project with individuals who have capacity to consent, you must not carry it out with people who lack capacity. And that's where that being confident about judging capacity and about understanding that it changes over time and may change during the course of a, of a project is really, really critical um, to make sure that you don't sort of inadvertently <coughs> fall into this territory without the right approvals or without the right controls and processes in place. It's all about protecting people that, that may capacity and about sort of following their, making sure their best interests are served. Um, so yeah, just contact us as early as possible and we will help do those things. Um, clinical trial, I'm not going to talk about that because we haven't got anybody doing that. I haven't got anybody yep. using human tissue. Yep. I always check because I know, because um, we, we have researchers all over the university and the researchers and humanities that are using human tissue and, and all over the place, so it's always worth checking. Um, bear in mind it also would include things like saliva samples and, and, and urine and it's not just 
whole organism of blood. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, it can be anything that potentially contains an intact human cell. So if you are, we know of anybody that's doing that, then let me know. Um, and just finally, other things to be aware of. Again, this is a little bit case by case, but there is some guidance on loan working. So that applies to loan working in the university. So being here out of hours, being in labs, for example, or in environments that may not be safe. Um, but it does also apply to working out in the community, carrying out field work, potentially going to people's homes or meeting people in, in cafes, cafes um, making sure that you've got processes in place and, and that people you're working with or that you always have somebody that knows where you are, um, that you've got arrangements in place for calling back in, for example, to tell people where, that you've finished and that you're, you're safe. Um, I'm sure there are. Are kind of standard arrangements that, that people have. Nice well, we've got, really we've got the centre handbook, center. which certainly yeah. touches on loan working. I don't know whether it, it looks at you know the kind of safety of people when they're going out to to do research, but it would be worth. I will check. Yeah, I even if it's it, just like a, a call. I don't think so. So I think it's something we should look to add. Yeah. Yes, we've got one that we've used on projects. So I'm happy to. Oh, thanks, Lorraine. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we won't reinvent yeah, the wheel. But even if it's just you know a central phone number that you ring to say, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, and a time limit. So if, time, yeah. if somebody hasn't rung by X, X time, yeah. for example, Perhaps then if you would do that, that would be fabulous. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that's really important to be aware of. Um, field risk assessment. So if you are doing field work, then it's a good idea to do a risk assessment. And the health and safety office can help advise on that if you have particular concerns. Um, even something as basic as going into somebody's house and not being sure if they have pets. You know, if they have a dog, what happens? Um, you know, do, do you mind going to houses with dogs? You know, it can be you know quite simple things like like that. You know, and then making sure that potentially you know you choose to meet in a cafe or a library or a public place rather than going to people's homes where you can <coughs> avoid it. So that's just a sort of aid to thinking through all of those things. Um, and if you are travelling internationally, then please remember to register it with the university so that you're covered by our travel insurance because if you don't register it you're not covered um, that also includes a bit of a risk assessment on you know in terms of if you're going deep sea diving or um, it can be very up helpful. on the top of a yeah. volcano or something um, so that's really worth doing and it also gives you access to sort of emergency um, reporting on you know where, where a situation in a country might change where there are where there are high risks for example, um, if Zena goes to California, we need to know she's earthquake safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite a bit. So that's just something to be aware of. Just make sure you register it. It's really easy. It's just a simple online form, but please make sure you do it. Um, even if you are based in another country and you're carrying out research activity in that country, um, you still need to make sure that you register it. Um, and there is, again, there's advice on those websites that I've given you. There's health and safety and the occupational health team that can also help. And I think that's me. I'm sorry, I've run over. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, You're happy to stay for a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we yeah, have yeah, any questions, well, that would be great. But equally, if you've got places you need to be, then by all means... <laughs> Teaching or whatever, then by all means leave. But if you've got if you want if you've got some questions, then anyone has got a few minutes, please do ask. I think the important thing is that you know we know 